From The Olympian Online, December 11th, 2014. Neville Bell, owner of New Harvest Nursery on Kaiser Road Northwest, reported the theft of a farm implement from the nursery's property on Wednesday night. The alleged male perpetrator appeared to have a large buck knife protruding from his waistband when he emerged from a shed shortly before midnight. Bell made a statement that the perpetrator, quote, only took a hoe and then he threw the knife on the ground like he didn't want it anymore. I don't care about the hoe, but he was a scary person. He looked crazy, and he walked so slow and weird I was afraid to do any kind of confronting. He said the man walked off into the woods, and by the time police came, they were unable to locate him. My name is Joel Spanauer. I met Samantha in 2013 at a screening of Come and See, the brutal anti-war film by L.M. Klimov. It was the kind of screening only diehard cinephiles attend, folding chairs in the basement of a museum. I decided to try on this intriguing stranger my famous move of sidling up creepily after the credits and just sort of lurking silently nearby as she drew coffee from an urn into a styrofoam cup. She offered me a weak smile, and I attempted what was, for me, a recklessly bold conversational gambit, saying, That ending, huh? She had already rebundled against the cold outside, and was almost drowning in a huge green scarf with orange snowmen all over it. She was pretty, but what I think I liked about her was that her short blonde hair was cut and styled so awkwardly and indifferently. I thought maybe here was someone like me, to whom fashion was a mystery never to be solved, so we had both long since given up. After fifteen minutes of nervousness and stumbling over my words, I worked up the nerve to suggest we dissolve to the coffee shop across the street, having gotten involved in discussing Rainer Fassbender. It never even occurred to her to take off her coat and scarf while we sat there for an hour. It wasn't that she was chilly, and it wasn't a defensive gesture. It just never occurred to her. Anyway, This, for me, was whirlwind-level courtship, and I was a little mortified when she asked if I wanted to pop upstairs to look at her DVD collection. Turned out she lived in one of the dim little apartments right above the coffee shop. But I needn't have worried that Samantha Cash was going to launch seductive moves that I wasn't remotely prepared for. Like me, she had no real education in that area. It was only because she was so without guile or presumption, and so unwisely trusting that she asked me up. And yes, all she wanted was to share her taste in movies with a fellow film nut. When I saw stuff like With Nail and I and Melancholia on her shelf, I suspected the trajectory of my life might change forever. But I didn't really know how to go about wooing this woman. I was 28, and like her, a veteran of exactly one romantic relationship. She had been so disappointed and confused in hers I think she'd slowly lost the belief that anyone would ever again find her alluring enough to pursue. As for me, I was just plain baffled about what women wanted, never had a dime to my name, and had simply found it safer to retreat into the world of theater, movies, and books. Fifteen is the number of drafts I guess I composed of an email to her the next day, suggesting we get together the next weekend at... um, Get this smooth move, a coffee shop two doors down from the one we'd just been to. During the day, not even for a meal, just another overpriced latte. She showed up in a distressed university sweatshirt, thrift store sneakers, and her spare pair of eyeglasses, which were taped on one side with a cut-down Spider-Man band-aid. By vanity, this woman was not possessed. This time, we talked for three hours. Oh God, that goofy, hiccupy, baby platypus laugh of hers whenever she was seized by something funny in mid-sip or mid-bite. When I first heard it, I was tempted to both propose marriage and assure the people sitting nearby that they need not run for the exits. When we recognized in each other that we found dumb humor a great defense against the horrors of the world, that erased any lingering conversational awkwardness. It's a wonderful moment between a budding couple when they're freed to share the things they hate and mock them together. 
I actually felt good telling Samantha tales of my current stupid job with a corporate caterer. She had completely outclassed me in the income department. She was something called a data archivist for a bougie IT firm in Olympia and had fascinating stories to share about their rather scary work in artificial intelligence, trying to build chatbots with rudimentary understanding of human morality. I tried to intrigue her with my half-assed adventures, writing and acting in universally ignored plays for a local black box theater group called The Angry Snowmen. By date number three, in the first week of April, it became obvious that our views of the world and its societies were mutually so dour, we had to confront it. Between the depressing movies we loved and our belief that humankind was doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over, just with nicer iPhones every year, we were an appallingly pessimistic pair. I made a lighthearted joke over hot cider beside a fire barrel about how we were probably bad for each other. To my surprise and discomfort, she didn't take that as a joke. She said when it came to mistrusting the world, maybe there was safety in numbers. It was then that I knew somehow she really was hoping we were going somewhere together. I invited her to the final performance of my group's latest wobbly show. She came, she laughed supportively while the four other attendees in the house did not. And she didn't look too uncomfortable when the plot took kind of a ridiculous turn that everyone in the group except the author, who delivered pizzas for a living and was high all the time, was embarrassed by. Our first kiss was that night on the A7 bus across Olympia. Our beginning was not a love story to be captured in oils by the Impressionists. There were no sonnets left at each other's doors or even heart emojis in various colors when we texted. No one will ever write a three-act play about the courtship of Joel and Samantha, two prematurely tired millennials whose idea of a big Friday night was to rearrange our Netflix queues. We were just two people who had found each other in the static, but saw actual romance as a clunky proposition best left to fictional characters. It was nice and unspectacular and easy, and I don't think Either one of us had the emotional energy to look around for anything more. Then there's that point in a relationship, month three or four maybe, where you learn what each other's fears are. Not the deepest ones, not yet, but the ones that itch just a little every day in the recesses of consciousness. I was genuinely afraid back then of nuclear war, that some rogue state or terrorist group was going to make the unthinkable happen real soon. Samantha's fears were a little bit more layered. She asked me if I'd ever heard of Moore's Law. That's the supposition that the power of computer processes will double every two years forever, an unstoppable geometric progression. In her five years working at Cap Cobra Innovations, she'd become afraid that things were moving way too fast for humans to ever be able to control that progress again. What specifically are you afraid of? I asked her once as we lay in the park on, fittingly, a Logan's Run beach blanket my mother bought me when I was 11. God rest her soul. She had trouble putting it into words. It was maybe just people soon getting to a point where they could not accept any flaw or inconvenience or even pause in the tech-assisted hum and flow of their lives. And I think, she said, it's going to be a rough world for people who can't perform as well as the machines. And now, let me try to describe the funny thing that happened to us without making us seem insane. Yes, a lot of couples adopt little idiosyncrasies in their communication, the most irritating being the pet names, of course, the schmoopies, the hunbuns. Or maybe they write dorky, inspiring messages to each other on a chalkboard they bought on the bottom floor of Ikea. Have a super meeting, champ! You got this! Stuff like that. One day, Sammy and I were checking out at a used bookstore, and the credit card swiper wasn't working for her. And for my benefit, I suppose, she threw a weird robot voice at it. She said, Sam, displeased with swiper apparatus. And I said, 
Swiper, Functional, Sam, Machine, Faulty, Recommend, Destruction. And the cashier looked at us like we were Mickey and Mallory from Natural Born Killers. Later at Subway, Sam criticized my condiment choices with the comment, Joel, revulsion, level, rising, condiment, software, update, required. To which I responded, Girlfriend, termination protocol set to activate in T-30 minus seconds. For whatever reason, we found the robot voices to be just the thing for what ailed us, and they continued in odd moments for weeks, increasing in frequency and complexity when no one was around to hear, and sometimes when they were. Thank God we had so few friends. In my mind, the voices always had a tinny echo attached to them, like displeasure with current movie selection causing internal component erosion, or Samantha bot tardy. Apology sequence required to continue. Anyway, cut to the summer of 2013, when we were habitually greeting each other in the robot voices, and generally busting them out so often, it wasn't even a conscious joke anymore. How did we get to this low point? I asked Sam once on the sofa when we had roboted our way through a criticism of Jaws 3 that left us giggling like idiots. We pinky swore, then and there, that before we became something unrecognizable to ourselves and others, we must, once and for all, end the private joke that had given us more pleasure than anything in our lives since the late 90s. The ban lasted about three days, when a cut to Sam's finger upon slicing a lemon resulted in a horrifying flow of blood onto the countertop. She held this alarming injury up to me and said, Vital signs dropping rapidly. Recommend preparation of replacement, Sammy. And I immediately said, Replacement unaffordable. Thank you for your service. So even imminent loss of consciousness wasn't as important as the joke. And we realized we were deeply ill. As I speak these words years later, and after musing again on the words of the psychiatrist, Sam would see for years after the incident which changed everything between us. I have my own uneducated theory about the subconscious origins of the robot voice. Intimidated as she had become daily by the ominous future of technology, those goofy verbalizations straight out of cheesy 1950s sci-fi probably seemed like a comfortable throwback. Seventy years ago, the concept of silvery machines becoming sentient and all-powerful was about as terrifying as the blob or Godzilla, something harmlessly far-fetched and abstract. It felt nice to embody creaky robots whose rebellion could probably be struck down by withholding a little WD-40, as opposed to the HAL 9000. And if we wanted to throw a little rusty foot shuffling and jerky arm gyrations into the mix when we dropped the voices on each other yet again, you know, adding a little performance aspect. Hey, that was between the sweethearts. I don't think there was anything wrong with Sam when I met her. Just the usual quirks. God knows I had mine. Persistent shoplifting fantasies among them. Sometimes I was a little worried about a particular belief she had that felt completely in conflict with her hyper-rational views on science and nature and religion. Since she was maybe seven or eight, she told me, she'd been occasionally convinced that an unseen presence lingered on the margins of her life, observing her. It was like part of herself had broken off early on, gone its own way, formed into a walking being more confident than her, and it would return occasionally to just watch her from afar. She'd always felt it was a male presence, Once at a concert in Sylvester Park, I saw her staring strangely at a person far off in the blanket and beach chair section, and she confessed that certain vague facial characteristics or mannerisms struck her as belonging to that mysterious other. It only hits me every few years, this feeling, she said pensively. It just never went away. Kind of like the remnants of an OCD thing I once had, I thought, where to this day, out of nowhere, I'll find it very preferable to even out the number of steps I take from point A to point B. I gave her a hug and reassured her, Insanity scan, negative. Sam's mind was strong in 2013. Her will was strong. I blame 
the airfield incident for everything. Just before Thanksgiving, Sam revealed to me a juicy little secret, which was that her parents had big-time money, having been early pioneers in designing decision-making software for small businesses. So when it came time for her to fly home for the holiday to Oysterville, the arrangement was not quite normal. Her parents allowed their employees to shuttle around the Pacific Northwest on a private jet if they needed. So Sam was going to hop on it, as she usually did each year, and make the 90-minute flight from Tiny Pask Flower Airport in Delphi over to Colfax. Clearly, I had made a good choice in potential life partners. So I drove her to the flight early Wednesday evening. We got to Pask Flower at about 6.40. Now, big-time money doesn't mean insane money, so what her parents did was list the jet with a charter company to deliver anyone else who might want to pay to be flown in that area, meaning there would be six Hibiscus software employees on board and about six regular folk, all gliding around in a Gulf Stream that seated 20. The weather was really bad that night, rainy and foggy, and I wondered whether the flight might be canceled, but there was no ice yet with the temperature hovering safely above freezing. The fields around South Bay had been frosted over already for days thanks to a powerful cold front. Temperatures were supposed to drop further around midnight. Parking at Pask Flower was a breeze and free, so I decided to wait with Sam inside the cute little terminal, which was surprisingly filled with people. Things were a little off between me and Sam that night. We'd maybe been getting on each other's nerves a bit about my job situation. And we hadn't gone anywhere or done anything remotely exciting for weeks. So it was probably for the best that we were having a five-day break. We kissed goodbye, and she walked out across the tarmac onto the plane at 7.20, huddling under her umbrella. She turned and gave me an exaggerated wave as she climbed up the steps into the cabin. I bought hot cocoa from a little cart a nice older lady had set up in the terminal, and I hung out until the plane started to taxi away. Little things about that night come back to me again and again, and I suppose they always will. The cute design of a sleeping cat on that cup of cocoa, the classical music playing in the terminal, and especially the faces of the few other people who had been waiting nearby for the Colfax flight. Sam and I had talked to one of them briefly. Her name was Shanice. She was a hyper-caffeinated senior in high school, traveling home after a debate club tournament, and she wouldn't know if her side had won the final or not for another week, and she was absolutely agonizing over it. On the plane, after settling in, Sam found herself sitting very close to Shanice, and they kept talking. And Sam also talked to a very late arrival named Matty Snyder, who she knew personally. He'd been the head of sales at Hibiscus Software since the very beginning. She'd liked him as a little kid because he'd always had an endless supply of funky toys in his office. And her parents would park her there and she'd play with them, never wanting to leave. A goofy, chubby, fun uncle was Maddie Snyder, who was a widower since 2010. The visibility on the tarmac was lousy and was going to stay that way. Through the windows of the plane... Sam didn't see much but fog and indistinct lights. The plane's ground roll toward its takeoff position was interrupted for about five minutes for reasons the passengers were never told. I had actually started to walk out of the terminal when I saw the plane stop out there, small in the darkness. I couldn't even read the letters and numbers on its side anymore through the formless, wet murk the night had become. I figured it was just the usual unexplained delay, so I headed out to my car. Sam could always text me if there was a real problem. At no point did the sheer number of small planes out there on the tarmac concern me, because what did I know about what was normal? I didn't know there had been a sudden flooding problem at Olympia Regional that was causing small planes to reroute to Pask Flower, and there was some shuffling going on to make enough room for everybody. The small ground control crew had a lot to deal with. A lot. The radio message that guided Sam's plane to runway 2C instead of 2A at the last minute, was never confirmed properly. I drove away, cursing the weather, avoiding the highway and taking a back road toward home instead. On the Gulf Stream, at about 7.45, 
Sam was looking out the window beside her across runway 2A and watching the blinking of a radio tower far away, distorted by the rain. The plane began to shake strangely, but not because of its engines. They were still powered mostly down. A hibiscus software employee looking out the opposite side said something very loudly in reaction to a startling visual out there. All he got out was the meaningless exclamation, What? Sam didn't even get a chance to fully turn around. She saw a curious, bright green flash of light fall across the face of a woman sitting nearby. And then, nothingness. No more memory. The Beechcraft Premier One that was attempting to take off from runway 1B struck Sam's plane at an inexact perpendicular. It was the entire night and half the morning before I got to the hospital, and it was only through a habitual and unhealthy check of the news online that I realized what had happened. Sam hadn't texted to let me know she'd gotten a Colfax, but we didn't really do that kind of thing. That felt a little clingy to us both. If I hadn't seen the news, well, her, her parents didn't even have my contact information. I met them at the hospital for an agonizing and awkward first meeting. And the doctor there explained that Sam was alive and stable. Concussion, four major broken bones, including her hip, burns to her lower legs and right arm that might require surgery down the line. Two people on her plane had been killed. And so had the pilot of the beach craft that had pulled up at the last second, but couldn't get vertical fast enough to avoid destroying both planes, sending machinery and bodies across the tarmac. Two of the hospitalized developed severe pneumonia because of their time lying there on the pavement in the cold rain as people flooded out of the terminal to try to help. And strangely, one of the people on board Sam's plane seemed to still be missing. This was Shanice Lander, the talkative young debate champ we had both spoken to. Sam's phone had been lost, but her folks assured me they would have her call or try to text me as soon as she was able. We weren't even allowed to truly see her yet, heavy sedation. That left only a series of daily updates from her parents on her very slowly improving condition. Nice people they were ex-hippies who had unexpectedly struck it very rich. Dedicated as ever to saving the earth and helping the poor, and given to what Sam called tiresome hand-wringing over their guilt about being wealthy, even as their tastes kept getting more extravagant. Every day I spoke with them, I felt more entrenched in the family. Years of familiarity unnaturally compressed into two weeks. Finally, Sam and I reconnected by phone, and then I was able to see her alone. She had a private room with a nice view of downtown. We could even see part of the museum where we'd met. Predictably, we had no words at first and just held each other and cried a little. She was grateful that I didn't have to see her with all her bruises. Still prominent on the right side of her face was a sort of half moon colored a sunset orange. In the end, she was in the hospital for a total of 18 days. And then her physical rehab began. She was not exactly overwhelmed by visitors outside of extended family. Her old college roommate, two people from her office. Like me, she hadn't built a lot of friendships, and she kept her co-workers at a distance. It was a little heartbreaking when she told me she thought she might be going away for a while, staying with her parents all the way in Oysterville. The hurdles ahead of her seemed mostly to be psychological ones. And talking to a hospital counselor made her think it was best for her to isolate and be in a place utterly without obligations or pressures, even benign ones. Blankets, comfort food, family, or childhood things all around. I told her I understood. I figured the obvious sympathetic strategy was to nod and say yes to whatever she wanted, right? I told her I'd visit every day till she checked out of the hospital, but she said every other day was enough. We did have a laugh or two while she was there, and we watched Walkabout together on a portable DVD player. But of the future, there was no talk. Leaving her room that last time before she was allowed to go home, I felt like I had maybe lost her to this tragedy and its uncertain aftermath. And the reset of our relationship was going to be long. 
and maybe painful. She told me she'd call me when she felt up for me driving to Oysterville to visit. But till then, she might be out of contact. She was taking some tentative psychiatric advice to stay away for a while from phones, the internet, even television. Real 19th century living till spring. Anything to preserve that state of calm. Save Sammy through tech deprivation. Program initiated. She joked darkly. Just these highly addictive painkillers are 21st century, she said to me. One tear running down the side of her face as she touched the bed table beside her. Still not able to reach her bottles of pills without discomfort. So I bought some fancy stationery and fancy envelopes and got ready to write a few letters. I never heard back from the very first one I sent. A text to her father went unanswered as well, which seemed to be by Sam's design. And that was the late winter, now 2014. It seemed like there was nothing I could do that wouldn't be intruding on the recovery she wanted. So, beginning in early spring... I spent my pillow time before sleep at night, preparing myself for a different headspace. One where Sammy was simply someone I had been very, very fond of who was simply taken from me by a horrifying random event, and then the mental adjustment the patient required after it. I'd maybe exchange Christmas cards with her for a few years before the inevitable final fade, and maybe come summertime, The warmer weather would make my getting out of bed every day seem to have some kind of point. But there came a day when I just couldn't hold out any longer. I had to try to talk to her, though the silence had told me it very well might not be welcome. I texted her father again, not in a pleading way, very exploratory. And he did text back this time, a couple of hours later. Sammy was there with her parents still, Her physical healing was more or less complete, and he asked me to call his number at about eight that night. She'd probably have the phone. In his second and last text that afternoon, he said he wasn't positive she'd be up for speaking. The hours leading up to that call were tense ones for me. I lay on top of my bed for a long time and just stared at the ceiling. I got four rings at 8.02 that night, and then I bust out smiling. When Sam answered the phone, Greetings, human. Your free trial phone call has begun. And all that weight of the months of silence melted away because of the stupid, wonderfully annoying robot voice. I laughed. Request results of Sammy software scan, I said, which had been our standard replacement for how are you. And she replied, Hard drive slowed by junk files, 61 gigabytes. I switched then to my standard boring Joel voice, the one that anguished experimental theatergoers hadn't even been able to hear properly for the last three years. But Sammy did not switch to hers. Oddly, she kept on with the robot, even when it must have seemed clear I was ready to move back to human things. She wouldn't drop the silly ruse in answering questions about her bones healing or if she was getting bored there at all, in remote Oysterville. Human speech setting on, I said to her. But there was only a long silence after that. And then, finally, she said, Setting corrupted. Drop-down menu deactivated. Something about the continued robot voice on only a so-so cell phone connection was so off-putting, as opposed to hearing it from a face I knew so well. I didn't know how to reply to setting corrupted. I tried to pick up where I left off, asking her if she was still thinking about me maybe driving out there sometime, just so she could show me her parents' hedge maze or their moat, whatever, show me how the other half lived. Schedule uncertain. She answered me. Just two words. Is it okay that I called? I asked. You're not mad, are you? She had to be, I thought. That's what the lack of humanity must have meant. Anger, scan, negative, said Robot Sammy. I shifted gears. I asked her a question about something light, her opinion of the new Terrence Davies movie, if she'd seen it. But the robot informed me her protocol for mass entertainments was still 
on pause. I mentioned some little tidbit of gossip I just heard about a mutual acquaintance's secret accumulation of parking tickets, but even that got a dry response from the automaton instead of Sammy. I stared out the window of my ugly apartment in bleak Jefferson Street Towers, and I closed my eyes in frustration after almost every comment I made and every question I asked, because it was clear the human Sammy would not be speaking to me. And just maybe it was because she psychologically could not. By the time the clock tower in the strip mall to the west read 811, I couldn't take any more. Gotta go for now, I said to her finally, very abruptly, trying to keep my voice steady. Will you call me in a couple of weeks, even if you're not ready for a visit? Schedule uncertain, she told me again. I told her I missed her, and I hung up the phone. I walked like a zombie down eight flights of stairs and out into the street. I bought butter pecan ice cream I did not really want, just to be among the crazy horde of students in Barney's Scoop Shack, to hear their chatter about stupid things I hadn't cared about for years. On July 13th, 2014, Sammy's mother invited me out of the blue to meet her and her husband for lunch while they were briefly in Olympia for a marketing conference. They had some better news about Sammy they could share. I accepted immediately without follow-up questions and was content to be grateful for the contact, assuming they had realized the one conversation between Sammy and I had been a disaster. It was quite a gesture, what they did, but that was the kind of people her folks were, Jonah and Nina. I think they figured I was still kind of poor and they wanted me to be at ease, because they said they were in the mood for a nice, divey burger place. They just didn't realize the Camelot Burger Inn was a seedy, dark bar, lit red through most of the gloomy interior. They had to walk a delicate line, sitting there in our dim back booth, sharing stuff about Sammy while not betraying the confidence she had with them, or with her new doctor. They were hyper-aware of not saying too much, but they slipped sometimes, meaning well. There was just no way to avoid it. Nina would lightly poke Jonah in the ribs, reminding him not to put words into the doctor's mouth or paraphrase Sammy too much, and he would comically slap his bald head and say, Forgive me, whose idea was it to let me be a parent? Sammy's psychiatrist was named Dr. Iris Ricks. She was a visiting scholar at Gonzaga University, from which I had graduated eight years before. Sammy's parents had spent a considerable amount of money and even plied some personal connections and a favor to have Ricks take her on as a patient. The woman was extremely in demand. Sammy's recovery arc, they told me when our dry burgers had been set indifferently before us, began with some group therapy specific to survivors of the accident through St. Luke's, and from there, Ricks had gotten her into a more free-form group situation for six weeks at Whitman in Colfax. Sammy had tentatively turned down one-on-one talk therapy. It was at St. Luke's that she had adopted the unusual habit of, well, speaking like a robot sometimes, often very much out of context. It was something her folks informed me she'd done very rarely on and off through her life. Ricks was of the belief that the voice was a kind of emotional retreat in uncertain times and situations. By reducing herself to a machine, Sammy was subconsciously pushing away her free will, the possibility of making wrong choices. Then the accident happened. The stress of group therapy and the strain of carrying buried memories of that night, memories that were beginning to push in on her, had perhaps triggered her into a state of increased Robotics, for the lack of a better word. The less human she was, the less frightened she could be of her own mind turning against her. Dr. Ricks thought it was best to let the voice and Sammy's emotionally distant behavior run its course. She should still be at home and outside of group for a while to better determine if that had been too triggering. If nothing changed fairly soon, Ricks might recommend removing the protective shell around her life a little to get her interacting more with people in non-therapeutic environments, and then she'd raise the prospect of one-on-one sessions again. Ricks had told them that what was going on with Sam was unusual, but not totally unforeseeable. It was a strange time, but she'd likely be 
Sammy again, all the way, soon enough. Ricks had advised her parents to keep one phrase always in mind, no pressure. Let the stricken walk their path. We might get very scared because we didn't understand where Sammy's path was going, but somewhere inside herself, she knew. Everyone needed to trust her. I didn't ask many questions during lunch. I did ask how much Sammy actually recalled of the accident. That was when I first learned in general about what she had seen and heard inside the plane. Everything beyond that moment of intruding bright green light had been suppressed. Everything. Ricks apparently saw some value in that, but she hadn't explained to Nina and Jonah what she'd meant precisely. I never asked about whether Sammy even knew about that day's lunch, or if she ever spoke of me. Someone joined us after our real talk, coming directly from that conference. A large guy with a graying red beard, confined to a wheelchair since the previous winter. It was Maddie Snyder, still director of sales for Hibiscus Software, survivor of the airfield incident, rescued from the cabin of the Gulf Stream, then having had to endure two surgeries to save his spleen. He and I shook hands, and he grinned widely and warmly. Half his face was still reddened from his burns. As he pushed himself outside onto the sidewalk, Maddie's cell phone chimed in an unusual way, and after looking confused for a moment, he laughed. My dating app telling me I have a match, he said. I forgot to delete it after I got burned, crippled, and spleen-challenged. Maddie continued to make jokes to lighten the mood as they all waited for their cab. Before we all parted, he reached up and slapped me strongly on the back, gave me his card, and winked. Anytime I wanted to get my butt handed to me in backgammon, to which I had claimed some expertise, I should look him up. There was something so different about him. Driving home, it occurred to me I may have just met that incredibly rare person in life who did not just have a healthy gallows humor about the darkness that unfolds us and a positive attitude in the face of crisis. I think Maddie Snyder, just a jovial uncle figure to Sammy when she was very young, might have been indomitable, one of life's quiet and relentless rowers, rowing against every brutal tide with a heart that cannot be shattered. It got dark out as I drove home, just one exit off Route 5. Still, I popped into my favorite rest stop just because I had a shameful weakness for the awful coffee in its vending machines. Coming out of that little brick hut, I stood for a moment, sipping and looking off at the forlorn picnic area beside the building with the bathrooms in it. There was someone standing beside one of the cheap plastic picnic tables, just kind of looking at me from afar. No food beside her on the table or anything, no backpack, nothing like that. A girl, a teenager, in a dark sweater and an open coat, despite the time of year. Headlights flowed a hundred yards beyond her in a furious, blinking array. I was a little unsettled by her stare, so I turned a bit abruptly and walked back to my car. Rolling out of the lot, I noticed she wasn't there anymore. She'd moved. There had been a disturbing hint of familiarity about her. I was in my apartment throwing my styrofoam cup away when it occurred to me where I'd seen someone who looked just like her. In the terminal at Pasque Flower Airport. The debate judges are power addicts, she'd said to me and Sammy, before she'd shuffled out with the other passengers onto the tarmac and onto the Gulf Stream. Sammy did not get that much better, not then. From her parents, I found out that she did finally agree to one-on-one -on -one therapy with Dr. Ricks, but to do so, she had to move down to Eugene, where she'd been set up with a little apartment. So she was now 220 miles away from me. She got back to communicating normally for the most part, but sometimes slipped back into her robot voice, apologizing for it later. I resumed my unspectacular life, and there were only occasional updates from her folks. Sammy had gotten remote work hand-editing scientific manuscripts. She continued to see Dr. Ricks, and normality was becoming a real goal. 
But Sammy never did write to me, never called me. She likes it in Oregon, her father texted me apologetically. She likes being near the ocean. I reread that a few times, thinking, that's it. Those last six words are the last time I'll ever hear from Jonah and Nina Cash. It was all right. I had long since begun to consciously let Sammy go. I wasn't dating, God knows. I found my loneliness to be familiar and comfortable, at least until I left my theater group. It wasn't rewarding anymore to write or act in plays that tried amateurishly to plumb the depths of anger and sadness, to lease a maturity about sorrow I didn't really own. Now that I'd had the experience of getting truly close to genuine tragedy, I felt ashamed at having fumbled around with the pretend version on a stage, fabricating those emotions based on so little life experience, playing with them like a kid uses a slinky to entertain myself, indulge myself. What happened to Sammy made fiction seem farcical, so I wanted out of it. Even my movie snobbery was failing me. The frankly harmless worlds of Freddy Krueger or Roger Moore's James Bond, which made no pretense of addressing the conundrum of human pain, had a new appeal for me. When I left the Angry Snowmen, my friendships there dissolved, more or less, as I always thought they might. And I was truly, for the first time since my early days at college as an angst-ridden freshman, alone. Then, three weeks before the anniversary of the accident, Sammy called me. The real Sammy. It was a good catch-up call, the one I never thought would happen. She sounded fine, seemed like her old self almost. She'd kept working remotely. She was very amused by my own strides toward conformity, namely having accepted an office job for an insurance group and now edging dangerously close to a promotion, possibly. Yes, I had sold out a little, clinging to casual Fridays as a salvation for my artsy soul. She invited me down to Eugene, promised to give me the whole tour of the town. Her tone told me it was not an empty invitation. I gleaned enough from the conversation to know she hadn't really made any friends down there. And so the week before Thanksgiving... I drove down the I-5, feeling weird and apprehensive. Yes, but also happy. I had a sense of completion. What I expected was a nice, companionable visit, and at its end, a necessary goodbye that seemed more fitting than our awful phone call months before. Ex-sweethearts getting together on the Oregon coast for one last friendly check-in, to write the end of the story in a bittersweet but acceptable way. No robot voices were invited, and none appeared unexpectedly. And of course, what happened was that I couldn't seem to leave. Driving, talking, coffee, lunch, dessert, walking endlessly from place to place. I forget the order it all happened, but I was going to be comically late in getting back on the road. And then, in a coffee house and gift shop, Sammy said to me, Dr. Ricks is a godsend. I'm doing great. Don't go back tonight. My place is big enough to be embarrassing. You know how my parents insist on helping. And of course, I stayed. I think I probably would have, even if she didn't seem so much like she used to. So funny and awkward and prone to fumbling over words in a rush to get them out. And full of her usual sunshiny venom towards all our favorite old targets. Even though she consciously hadn't even brushed against pop culture for almost a year. And I had to fill her in on lots of, well, nonsense. Most of it film-related. Her hair was much longer, but still carelessly tended to. It made her more alluring to me, yet powerfully different. A different version of the same person. She'd gotten a cat, too. Bernie Birnbaum. I stayed the night, and then we agreed, without speaking, that I'd stay for another one. And there was no doubt Our jigsaw pieces were locked together again. And I felt so peaceful on the way back north, I pulled over beside a pretty cemetery outside of Wilsonville and just sat there in the sun beside a fountain in humble awe of the complexity of it all. Love's maze of baffling circuitry. 
I was still young enough then to believe secretly in happy endings. I spent the oddest Thanksgiving of my young life with Sammy and her parents at their modest mansion in Oysterville. Nina and Jonah seemed genuinely happy to see me again. It was there that the non-digital lifestyle Sammy had adopted really asserted itself, and I experienced how different it was. Sammy's dad and I had been talking geekily about football before the turkey came out, but that night there was no TV in the corner with the games on and no predictable post-meal movie with the family. There was just cozy talking, and later an especially confrontational game of upwards. Originally, the information and entertainment detox that Sammy's first doctor had recommended was designed partially to keep her away from any troubling news about the accident. Now, though, without a cell phone, without cable, without her own computer or social media, Sammy seemed to be living on a slightly elevated plane of existence. When she got up every day now, she wasn't immediately given 12 reasons to hate the world or feel obligated to respond to it. She lived locally, among the people and things she knew well and was fond of. The frantic clashings and boiling points in society had become meaningless. She caught up to them when she felt like it, and she got most of her information and worldview from reading three-month-old issues of Descent magazine. I hadn't myself been able to keep away from the awful clickbait that had drawn me into the fate of young Shanice Lander, and couldn't stop thinking of what it might do to Sammy to read about that particular narrative as it had unfolded in the days after the accident. We went to the ocean a couple of times, which to me has always been a place where time stops and aging ceases. At the coast, I felt like I was eternally 10 years old. Sammy too, I think. The folks are working at a mission in San Francisco for Christmas, she told me in mid-December. What are you going to be doing? We were at Sea Rose Beach when she asked me that. Big cups of takeout coffee in our hands. The Pacific, vast before us. And finally, a little money in my pocket. Let's just drive the coast, I suggested. I liked the idea of an illogical, wandering drive, slamming a door on the bad things that had happened. It was the kind of irresponsible, anti-holiday maneuver only the truly young and free would try. So I wanted to do it. And we almost made it work. How did Dr. Ricks work her magic, was how I phrased the question that nearly ended our togetherness for the second time. We were sitting on the screened-in front porch of a little Airbnb in Neskowin, and it was night and raining. I might have been able to go forever not knowing just how Sammy had been repaired, saved maybe, but I asked. It was really the dumb question of a layperson baffled by the mysteries of psychiatry. Through knowing Sammy, I had become both shaken and impressed by the malleability of the human mind. Here is what she told me. There had come a critical point in her therapy when she seemed to be recovering memories of the actual accident, and she was not responding to this well at all. It was then that Dr. Ricks had made the decision to try an alternative sort of treatment she had researched and tested off and on for years, and written about extensively. She called it carrier and comfort. Through hypnosis, she had asked Sammy to visualize the construction of a kind of memory lockbox. It was six feet high, this imaginary box, Sammy told me. Looked a lot like an old school phone booth. Into this glass box went her emerging memories of the accident, which, if they made their way fully into her conscious thoughts, could drag her back into a deep depression. Sammy was asked to imagine those memories clasped by a living, breathing being who was locked inside that box. To imagine sending both it and the memories away forever, so that they could never return to harm her. Not kill them, no, because they were part of her after all, and to turn them into enemies was unwise. They and the carrier were just being asked to live a life far away. Dr. Ricks's voice, which sometimes came to Sammy under hypnosis in the form of beautiful calligraphic notes on red pieces of paper, said, Now let's give the carrier 
that robot voice to take away with him. What do you say? And Sammy had said, yes, I want to give that away. And then from Dr. Ricks, let's give the carrier a name. He's not a villain, Sammy, so let's give him a name before we say goodbye to him. And Sammy had laughed a little, and she laughed again when she told me this on the dark porch of that Airbnb by the ocean. He should have a robot name, she had suggested. Dr. Rick said that was just fine. And so the robot carrier, clutching Sammy's potentially traumatic memories to his chest, was christened 41584, which was her birthday plus one day. Sammy remembered images of her pushing the giant glass box in a rolling cart along a sidewalk beside a great rushing river in the woods. She'd pushed the box off the cart, down an embankment, and the rapids had taken it away. What if he gets out? Sammy had asked Dr. Ricks, worried, to which had come a soothing reply. The river is going all the way to the other side of the world, Sammy. It doesn't matter. 41584 is welcome to speak robot in Polynesia. Remembering all this, Sammy was not even now entirely sure what she'd said and heard under hypnosis, or even what had been dreams or a part of live sessions whose memories had become hazy. She only knew that after only about six more hours of talk therapy, she felt almost as light and as free sometimes as she had when she was in her early twenties. No trace of emerging memories of the airfield, and no desire to speak in the robot voice. Were there any drugs involved? Any medication? I asked her. Just the usual stuff to help keep me in the hypnotic state, she said. Sitting close beside me on the wicker sofa, she'd begun to sense the doubt in my voice, the worry. How did she put you under? I asked. She told me the method was very simple. Sammy had sat at a table, and had been asked to move her hands across its surface in wide arcs, wide rotations, very gently, and she counted upward, starting at one, visualizing each number as a tree with more leaves on it. When she got to a tree that was completely verdant, she would tumble head over heels into the forest, which was the hypnotic state. Cute, but strange, Sammy said. I got up then, and went to the screen, looking out toward the water, trying to take this all in. You mean, basically, I said, that the method she picked was total denial. Carrier and comfort, Sammy said, a bit of irritation edging into her voice. The name was very carefully chosen. So what happens if you suddenly do remember everything sometime, I asked. Is it going to make everything worse now? Why would it? She said. And I said, well, I don't know. It just sounds like some kind of wish fulfillment fantasy. And that statement turned the talk stressful for her, and she got a little angry. And I closed my eyes, and I took it all back. I apologized. I didn't know what I was talking about. Of course, Dr. Ricks was the expert, and we tried to get past it. Later... Long after we'd laid down to sleep with the sound of the waves far away, Sammy rested her head on my chest and whispered, You can't understand the sadness of just hoping for one day of feeling what you used to be like. I just held her, and we drifted away. And the next day was better. The next day was all about a used bookstore with a stone tiger out front, and just down the road the best raisin hala we'd ever tasted. My own research into Dr. Iris Ricks only took a day or so, sitting in the college library when I got back to Olympia. One of her three books was even in the stacks on the second floor. It was about child psychology. Her treatise on carrier and comfort therapy had been digitized through the University of Washington. The articles I could access about this technique online were responsibly peer-reviewed, And so were two fairly strong rebuttals of her work. I read a couple of case studies online in the tomb-like quiet of the library. One concerned a victim of a random act of street violence in Queens. 
The other was the case of a man who had tried everything to address his alcoholism but failed. In the former case, the patient had created a sort of blind and mute half-brother through hypnosis, while the alcoholic had been asked to transfer his urges to an imagined gentle giant who carried a teddy bear. In neither case had the therapy completely served its purpose, but it had bought both patients a lot of stable time to work on their issues. I watched a video of Rick's speaking on some panel. She had a very easy demeanor and a cheerful sense of humor about popping her peas into her microphone. I could make out on the video that she even had a tattoo on her neck. It looked like a sandcastle. On that panel, she revealed that the origins of carrier and comfort came from her own experience as a post-grad in California, coping with an attack by a blood-drinking killer named Jody Burr. This made me feel more uneasy. After the library, I swung by the student center for old time's sake. God knows I'd spent too much time as an undergrad there, eating junk food and avoiding studying by watching baseball highlights on the TV bolted over an air hockey table. I sat for a while just before the campus staff started closing the place down for the night and students drifted back to their dorms. The TV was turned to the local 10 o'clock news. The second story was about the lawsuit that the parents of Shanice Lander had just filed against Pask Flower Airport and two related entities for negligence in what happened to their daughter not just in the crash of November 2013, but what happened immediately afterwards. I was riveted again by the story. Like so many others, I couldn't look away. Even as I prayed, Sammy was still protected from all of this. And that night was when I had the worst nightmare of my life, lying alone in my apartment. A nightmare stitched together from the real facts I knew from the news, which then got stylized by the cruelest corners of my subconscious. In the dream, I saw a bright green light flash over the face of a passenger named Wendy Dahl five seconds before the beach craft crashed into the Gulf Stream and sent me tumbling through the air and onto the rain-drenched tarmac beneath the plains. I heard a roar and felt a rolling tide of pure yellow heat flow over and past me like a flaming barrel. I heard Sammy crying out. She was saying, where's my slinky? Where's my slinky? I heard a man screaming, over here, over here, we need oxygen. I was paralyzed below the chest. I lifted my head off the tarmac. Something enormous was on fire nearby. The cold rain sizzled off metal surfaces. I saw a figure far away. Shanice Lander was walking slowly away from the wreckage of the plains. Bystanders and Samaritans were running everywhere, but no one seemed to notice Shanice, or they thought that she too was someone out there trying to help. Maybe she'd spotted another survivor. At the moment of impact, one of the wheels of the beach craft had been flung so hard into the fencing a hundred yards south of the runway that it had collapsed a portion of it. Shanice was headed that way, wearing her winter coat drenched by the rain. Her backpack had been left behind. In shock, she walked across the fence boundary and started across a small, snow-covered field toward the white woods beyond. In the dream, she got smaller and smaller in my vision. I opened my mouth to tell someone tending clumsily to my injuries that there had been a girl on the plane and she was wandering away from the wreckage, but no sound came out. Shanice suddenly dropped clumsily out of sight, barely having time to throw her arms up to break her fall. A hole had opened up in the thin ice of the tiny pond whose surface she had errantly wandered onto. Just two feet of water. But it was enough to swallow her up. I saw it happen in my nightmare. Shanice, the debate champ. The trees beyond seemed to keep waiting for her to emerge from that little hole. She never did. When they found her the next morning, it seemed inconceivable that it could have happened the way it did. But in the chaos and confusion and panic, that was, based on all the known evidence, exactly the way it happened. 
That was the part of the whole story that few who knew it could forget. I was a wreck at work the day after that dream. I sent an email to my boss after lunch and told him I wasn't feeling well and was going home. It would be fine. My new job had a good personal leave policy. It had a good everything. I went in every day, sat in front of a computer for eight hours, then went home. With the nice paychecks I was getting, I had begun, for the first time in my life, to casually narcotize myself with all the things I'd never been able to afford before, including all the latest digital and robotic conveniences. High-end cell phone, cable package with all the movie channels, refrigerator with ice cube maker, Ford Taurus with heated seats and Bluetooth capability, and even a pre-order for a new thing that Apple had coming out, a watch that could flow in harmony with your laptop. Had a new one of those, too. These were the things that were comforting me and erecting cushiony walls against the nagging sense that all my creative impulses were quietly fading into my past. If Sammy wanted a powerful mechanical device to take her anguish halfway across the world, I seemed to now own quite a few of them. And every day I felt like I was becoming a kind of device myself, harmlessly, painlessly, just like everyone I knew. All of us joined in an elite class of cheerful robot-human hybrids, synchronizing our calendars, our playlists, and our anxieties. On December 6th, Sammy and I were together at her apartment. I was staying the weekend. It had been a pretty good day. We'd gone for a hike and then cooked dinner in. Sometime well past midnight, I woke up becoming aware that she'd gotten out of bed and was sitting at her work desk in the dark, but turned the wrong way around, facing the bed. She explained to me what she was feeling, and had been feeling most of the last two days. A few hours before I'd come into Eugene, she'd been down the street picking up some tea for us, and she'd heard a random mechanical ratcheting sound from somewhere nearby, like one heavy metal object was having trouble lifting another the kind of thing you hear several times a month living in a city. But this time, it had gotten into her mind that the sound had been made intentionally to let her know that someone who had gone away was back. It was a little friendly signal. I nodded and told her I got it, though of course I couldn't, really. She'd gotten out of bed 20 minutes before when the final image of a nightmare had woken her. She'd been standing on a vast, frozen lake with a strange, almost Martian-like planet low in the sky. It was beaming intense orange light all around, a permanent sunset. Some tall man with no discernible facial features was walking toward Sammy across the ice. Slowly and clumsily, his arms outstretched, beckoning. Each step as it got closer sent another mechanical ratcheting sound through it, right into the bottoms of her feet, where the sound vibrated and locked her feet firm to the ice so she couldn't run away. I thought it was 41584, she said. I thought he wanted to hurt me. She was due to meet Dr. Ricks that week. She did go. Sammy later reported there wasn't too much cause for alarm, The man on the ice may have even been a manifestation of her old, imagined pseudo-doppelganger, the one she used to imagine was out there somewhere, watching her, tracking her life, meaning no harm. She'd never mentioned that belief since the accident. Never had one of those manifestations before, though, have you, in your dreams? I asked her, and she could only reply, no. The spiral, as I think of it, A spiral leading down, swift and irrevocable, began only a week later. In the early morning of December 13th, a rock climbing instructor named Lucas Thorpe, who lived in Malone Porter, about 30 miles away from my apartment, became overwhelmed with concern about a strange silence from his younger brother, Dennis, who he'd been expecting a call from for a day and a half. Dennis Thorpe, 
age 34, currently unemployed, had lived alone for the last three years in a tiny A-frame house in the woods, a cute structure he'd bought and built himself for less than $30,000. Because of a recent traumatic event Dennis had suffered, Lucas had made a point to keep in touch with him more often. They'd agreed to go Christmas shopping together for their mother and sister that afternoon in the city. But Dennis hadn't called back to confirm the day or night before. And now there was no answer to several cell phone calls. This was especially concerning because Dennis had seemed unsettled by a mysterious call he'd received two nights before, but hadn't been able to give his older brother many details about. He'd said only that a strange person talking like a machine had twice whispered something into the phone about a correction that was needed to his programming. And then the line had gone dead. At about 9 a.m. on the 13th, Lucas got on his car and nervously drove the 11 miles to Dennis's little house, which was secluded down a country lane called Widow's Fair. When Lucas arrived at the property, a small and crudely fashioned woodland oasis, he saw that Dennis's pickup truck was parked over near his woodpile. But there was no answer to knocks at the front door. Finally, Lucas tried the doorknob and found it unlocked. There was very little to the A-frame house. The entirety of its interior was more or less visible from the front doorway. Lucas saw immediately that the door to the bedroom, the only enclosed room in the house, was open. And in there, the bedding, blankets, sheets, pillows, had been entirely removed from Dennis's bed. Getting closer, it appeared that the headboard had sustained a single blow from a sharp object, leaving a long gouge in it. Lucas didn't know if it had ever been there before, but it stuck with him. He made a wide walking circle around the property, calling out for his brother. His attention went back to the pickup truck beside the woodpile. Lucas walked over to it and then around it, and he saw a bundle of blue bedding dumped there beside the stacks of firewood. Dennis was wrapped inside the bedding and partially propped up against the side of his truck. His head had been partially crushed through more than a dozen blows by a sharp instrument, which had left deep wounds spanning his entire forehead, where the focus of the attack had been concentrated. Blood and the grass and dirt close by suggested that Dennis might have been rendered unconscious in the bedroom by an initial attack, but then beaten more brutally once he had been dragged outside, perhaps regaining consciousness and fighting back. The killer had clumsily etched two words, just barely legible, into the GMC's right rear door panel, creating a crude headstone. The letters spelled out the words, Faulty Human. The media was quick to learn exactly who Dennis Thorpe was, though those two words on the GMC were kept secret from it. The news broke quickly that the air traffic controller blamed for the miscommunication that led to the Pasque Flower Airport disaster the previous November had been found gruesomely murdered. Sammy and I were back in our respective apartments when it happened, and she called me two days later as she was riding a bus downtown to speak to someone from the Washington State Police, who were sending a man from their jurisdiction to Eugene to talk to her informally. She sounded very calm. She had gotten her only information directly from the police, not from the news. I wasn't able to break away, not just yet, so I told her to hang on for just another day and I'd come. The talk with the police seemed mostly informational and meant to calm her and reassure her, but its urgency felt unusual. And she went through a surreal moment when she knew that despite what she called the detective's subtlety and delicacy, He was obligated to inquire about her alibi for the late night and possibly morning of Dennis Thorpe's murder. Sammy didn't exactly have one that was airtight. She was asked about people she either knew or associated with on the plane and in her months of therapy afterward, pressed for relevant details about anyone who seemed to have had an unusually strong reaction to the accident's aftermath. Sammy's talk with the police lasted only about a half an hour. 
She returned to her apartment at a little past 7 p.m. on the 16th and got under the covers. Far to the north, Dennis Thorpe's tiny house in the woods had been roped off and was being guarded by two policemen watching the dark. Alone, unable to sleep, Sammy got up at about 10 and decided to get out of the apartment, go somewhere, anywhere. There were a few things she needed from the grocery store, so she walked two blocks to Albertson's. It would close at 11, so it was just her and a handful of other shoppers wandering the quiet aisles. She was in the pasta section looking for orzo when something unusual caught her eye. On the top shelf where the sauces were, someone had cleared out a little space and stacked six jars of prego marinara in a simple pyramid. Not a formal display, no. Just a bit of spontaneous and meaningless activity, as if a child had become bored waiting for their mom to make her choices. But it was way too high for a child to have done. Sammy found herself staring at those jars. They meant nothing, surely, but the simplicity of the structure made her imagine it was the kind of thing a robot might have decided to build, to maybe test its dexterity skills, and then been pleased with. Almost perfectly symmetrical, the labels all facing the exact same way. Project accomplished. Human being practice completed. Sammy looked up to see someone all the way down the aisle, smiling at her. A very large, bald man in a store apron, grinning inappropriately wide. Do you need any help? He asked her, walking forward. Sammy turned away from him without a word. She left her grocery basket sitting on the floor and she hurried out of the store. She was shaking when she got back into bed, her pulse still pounding. In Olympia, I was lying awake, trying not to call her yet again to see how she was doing. And nearby, the police were learning a lot from their talks with St. Luke's hospital staff, enough to make a delicate call to Sammy at 11. Detective Emmett Claypool recommended to her that she be in the company of someone she knew for a little while. In other words, it might be safer to not be alone in her apartment. The ringing of the phone had woken her from another terrible nightmare of a faceless phantom pounding on a glass tomb and screaming its own name over and over again. 41584. 41584. I am 41584. In the minutes after the fatal collision on the runway at Pasque Flower Airport 13 months before, more than a hundred people ran out of the terminal and onto the tarmac through the pouring rain, creating a great deal of confusion. Many Samaritans were able to provide valuable help, while some could only stand, bewildered, unable to. And some even got in the way of first responders, who managed to wave everyone back to safety over the course of 20 minutes. Among that mass of terrified humanity, Shanice Lander may have seemed like just another wandering soul, tragically overlooked. There was one other important player in the drama of that night who no one seemed to notice much. It took piecing together many people's fragmented memories to make this other person's story clear. His name was George Vidor. He was 29 years old and was at the airfield that night only to drop off a job application for a part-time position as a small aircraft refueler. He had taken a bus from the edge of Delphi then still had to walk a half mile through the cold and the rain. When the collision happened, and the runway exploded in hot flashes of yellow and orange and white, he joined the crowd making their way outside to help. Those few who remembered glimpsing him said they thought he didn't do too much, just watched, mostly. He was tall, over six feet, swaddled in a puffy down jacket that was ripped in several places. He had it scrunched up almost to his eyes to keep warm. About 30 minutes after the crash, when Shanice Lander had already vanished, when almost everyone other than official medical and fire and police personnel had been moved back into the terminal, George Vidor was for some reason still out there and lurking dangerously close 
to a section of the Beechcraft's burning fuselage. A spontaneous settling of its components caused by the intense heat of the flames suddenly toppled a great steel mass, and it crushed Vidor's lower leg. He had to be pulled out from underneath, screaming, and was rushed to the hospital among many others. He was bedbound in pain for three weeks, a titanium rod permanently embedded in his right leg. Like almost all the other survivors of the accident, he was visited several times by mental health counselors. He was offered a series of free group therapy sessions to help him work through what he saw and experienced on that night. He agreed to attend. That was where he met Sammy. Sammy had never told me about George Vidor, and how deeply strange he was eventually revealed to be. The advice of the police that Sammy not be alone because there might be a chance the killer of Dennis Thorpe had specific hostilities involving the accident frightened us both badly. They were legally obligated to be frustratingly vague. Sammy crashed the night of their call on her cat sitter's sofa, and she and I agreed to meet and hunker down at her folks' house in Oysterville until we got more information. They would be flying in on Wednesday morning from helping Maddie Snyder's home health aide move him into his new retirement condo, so it would be just me and Sammy on Tuesday night. She would get there at about six. I decided to go down earlier than I even told her I would, because the last thing I wanted was for her to show up at that big house alone. I pulled into the circular driveway at what I kept calling the mansion, just as it was getting dark. The place wasn't precisely secluded. The neighbors on both sides were fairly close by. Everyone just had so much land that it was a hike to get to the next house over. Each house was of a price range well beyond my imagining, and the grounds of each were at least partially wooded, sometimes by careful design. The mansion even had a big pond out back where geese lived the good life, while the front lawn sloped gently downwards for a hundred yards, dotted with two winding, pebbled footpaths with waist-high hedges snuggling against them. I got out of the car, and having no key or familiarity with the security system, I couldn't do much but wait for Sammy. I hadn't been able to convince her to go back to using a cell phone, just enough to text back and forth for my peace of mind. So aside from her first call that she was getting into her car and headed to Oysterville, There weren't going to be any updates unless she broke down and used the little no-contract phone her parents had begged her to keep in her glove compartment in case of emergency. Thirty minutes on this little sucker just raring to go, Sammy had reported. For the first time, I strolled the expansive front lawn alone, wishing I'd brought gloves with me. And then I went around to the back and stood beside the silent pond, looking off into the barren winter woods as the sky went fully dark. I got back in the car when I got too cold and closed my eyes to rest after taking one last look at the house. There were a couple of lights on inside, just for appearance's sake. What I didn't realize then was that those symbolic lights were the only security system Jonah and Nina had for the house. True to their undying hippie beliefs, they didn't believe much in protecting mere possessions. Aside from the very basic locks on the outer doors of the place. There was very little to stop anyone from getting inside for whatever purpose they might have had. When George Vidor was 17 years old, he and his parents were victims of carbon monoxide poisoning in their small rural cabin in East Tacoma. The faulty design of the heater killed Melvin and Margaret Vidor, and put George into a coma for two weeks. He never did return to school. He never lived with anyone after that. At 29, he had never owned a computer, so he had no traceable online activity, not even through a library card. He did not own a cell phone, a car, or sign up for cable TV. No one who called themselves a friend to him was ever found. Detectives were eventually lucky to track down a couple of ex-teachers who had foggy memories of him, one of whom made the comment that George did not seem at all interested in his surroundings or the people in them, seemed generally 
lost in the world. Since the death of his parents, police had talked to him one time in his life. That was when the man who had been sued on Melvin and Margaret Vidor's behalf for damages relating to the faulty heating system that killed them was crushed in a hit-and-run accident. George had been 19. Though he was listed as a person of interest in the case, no charges were ever filed. He'd never gotten a driver's license. But you don't need to take a test or own a vehicle title to figure out how to get behind a wheel and knock someone so hard into a wire fence that they're nearly cut in half. With the financial settlement he'd received after his parents' deaths, he'd managed to eke out an unnoticed and unchallenged existence, moving around the Pacific Northwest anonymously, living a non-life. Occasionally he would apply for a job, always something involving the operation of machinery, but he was never hired. He said virtually nothing during group survivor therapy at St. Luke's, and certainly nothing memorable. One day, while waiting for a session to begin, Sammy had lapsed once again into her robot voice when offering George Vidor a piece of gum. He had responded likewise. The two of them went on to share this little voice from time to time. George took to it immediately and seemed to really like it when he and Sammy would speak exclusively in the voice, away from the other patients. They never exchanged much personal information, and Sammy remembered little about him, except his insistence on greeting her as the George Pot, commenting on the weather as the George Pot, chatting about empty and forgettable things as the George Pot. George will visualize your structure later, he would say. And she'd say, This structure has been programmed for reappearance on Wednesday. Sammy, still at that time trapped in the most difficult mental storms of her life, found comfort in just rolling with the routine. But then George Vidor vanished from group therapy without a word. By then, he'd listened to enough of Sammy's talk in the sessions to glean and figure out a fair amount about her personal life, including who she was related to and that she had been dating a man named Joel. Me. Inevitably, the question of why Vidor had left the group sessions so suddenly and permanently was investigated, and Sammy had only remembered that his responses to her simply stopped after she told him firmly she didn't want the robot talk anymore and he had become completely silent. This odd character who, according to a counselor at St. Luke's, refused to go near personal computers, having an intense paranoia about mechanical parts he could not see and touch. But she recalled the look on his face as he sat in that last group session, offering absolutely nothing of himself to the conversation, as always. She said it was like something had both dawned in his eyes and a light had gone out entirely. She'd begun to wonder if there was something very wrong with him that no one knew about. Then, just like that, he was gone. When police went through the possessions left behind in his room, they found a great deal of science fiction novels, few of them more recent than the 1970s. He seemed to read the genre to the exclusion of anything else, except for magazines like Nuts and Volts, Popular Science, and Servo. He liked his research, did George. Liked to find things out on his own, in secret. In fact, a toll booth ticket and fast food receipt left in his desk eventually suggested he'd found his way to Oysterville once before. A month after starting group therapy at St. Luke's, his obsession with Sammy already taking shape. God only knows how close to her and to her parents he had been without them ever knowing someone was watching. Sammy pulled up at the mansion at 6.30. Exhausted from too many emotions already that day, she hugged me somewhat stiffly, and I didn't press her on anything. Nina and Jonah kept their fridge pretty well stocked, and I made us some chicken with some brown rice and gravy, and Sammy surprised me by saying she wouldn't at all mind the sound of the TV 
some sports thing I liked maybe just in the far background. It would soothe her, those voices. So I put on a Blazers game and we listened to a couple of old records of hers in the small solarium that looked out over the back pond. We talked about the merits of the various film versions of A Star is Born and tried desperately to find some common ground in our opinions of David and Lisa and Pretty in Pink. The stress of the day wiped us out by about nine, and we decided to go to bed after her folks called to say they were still on schedule to roll in at noon the next day. We didn't say much to each other as we lay in the dark, there in her bedroom, decorated during one of her college years when her parents had first bought the house. An REM poster of the bed, the one sheets for all the pretty horses and lost in translation beside the bathroom door. Fading remnants of the younger Sammy, who knew nothing of me. I ran a hand through her hair the way she liked, gently massaging her temple. Her hair had gotten so long. She'd been dressing a bit differently, too, attempting sort of a different style, still very casual, but with more carefully chosen color combinations. And she didn't have pure sweats and sneakers days anymore, like I still did, not really. Even her opinions seemed more forceful now. Before I slept, I thought about how quickly we had fallen into our old routine, despite all the things that had been happening. A nice routine, for me. Comforting, like it used to be. But it felt like something had to change, because she was changing. While I saw myself as rowing in place, only with more money to spend. Turning over on my pillow, I couldn't stop myself from thinking about how briefly my time in the world and Sammy's time had intersected. I had about as much true understanding of her as I might of a portrait of her in a gallery I came to every day. I could linger at it for hours in a silent, echoing room and read the card on the wall about its history and its meaning. But in the end, it felt like The lights were always turned out around me. I always had to go back home alone. And that portrait could not belong to me. 4.49 a.m. To this day, I can't precisely define the sound I heard that woke me up. I only know that it was something far away and so subtle that I believe it was my subconscious that reacted to it more than my waking being. A thump, a click, I just don't know. Maybe only therapy could recover that knowledge. Sammy looked very peaceful beside me. I was too warm. I climbed gently out of bed, and before I turned the thermostat down just a little, I stood and listened for a minute. The house, so flawlessly built, did not creak or moan or allow the whistling of the wind to even slightly disturb the peace. I went to the window, which looked out over the back of the property. On that clear night, I could see that the pond down there had partially frozen over as the temperatures continued to fall. Everything out there had a grim, gray cast to it, the pond's surface dull and lifeless. That weak ice would not support the weight of even a child, probably. Only in the act of turning away from the window did I see him. At the furthest edge of my peripheral sight, as the contents of the bedroom again swallowed almost my whole field of vision, a tall, thin man standing before the pond, draped in an overcoat that went down past his knees, Hands clasped behind his back, short, messy hair blowing around his head. He was gone in an instant, a remnant of a dream that hadn't been able to find me in my sleep. No human, no ghost lingered out there in the cold. Yet I knew I had just seen Sammy's decades-old protector, the wanderer who did not really exist. That was him. A crazy thought took hold of me. He's facing the wrong direction. He can't protect her looking there. 
I formed my hands into fists to release the jitters. All right, what's happening here? I thought, and I slipped out of the bedroom into the hallway in my sweatpants and old t-shirt, leaving the door open behind me. I passed a spare bedroom on my left and was then at the top of a carpeted staircase that hooked down into the airy and expansive living room, which I could see spread out below me in total because of the fashionable open design. The room was dark like the rest of the house, except for the kitchen and master bedroom upstairs, where single bulbs struggled to push away the gloom. The dark down there presented a logical problem. We'd left the living room lights on when we'd gone to bed. Of that, I was sure. But then I thought Sammy or her parents had said something once about them being on a timer. Not that night, no, but once before at some point when I had visited. So it made sense, sort of. I didn't live there. I didn't know things. I descended the open staircase, whisper quiet. It bent twice, architecturally ambitious if not entirely functionally necessary. When I reached the bottom floor, I listened again, looking down the hallway into the solarium on the west side. Nothing moved in the kitchen, of which I could see only an illuminated sliver two dozen steps away. The electric fireplace near me exuded the faintest red glow and gentlest ambient heat, turned down to almost nothing. It could be, Iris Ricks wrote later, after weeks of studying the documents and evidence that accompanied the case, that Vidor recognized the chance in willingly becoming a living, breathing robot, to completely abandon the free will he found so oppressive and bewildering all his life. But more importantly, it gave him the chance to ascribe his darkest impulses to another being entirely, something pre-programmed, without control, and thus without guilt. In this way, he could utterly give in to the homicidal rages which were more and more consuming him, and resulted in the four deaths we know about. As the frequency of the rages increased, he may have been looking for the ultimate escape from human guilt. He likely found the key after the surgery which rendered him partially artificial. When Samantha Cash first began speaking to him in her robot voice, these factors could have created a powerful connection, a powerful passageway that had never existed for him before. And when the police came calling, and he perhaps guessed that his only ally in the world had betrayed him to them, his last course was set. When in the living room I felt a faint, unexplained draft on my face, I turned to the house's shadowy south side, and a few steps down the hallway toward the den brought into view the wide open window at the hallway's end. George Vidor was already inside the house, standing on a pricey wool carpet. Spotting me, he came forward slowly as I backed into the bigger, safer space of the living room. If I had explored the kitchen beforehand, I might have spotted the old stolen minivan he'd patiently tracked Sammy in, parked far down the curb in the no man's land between this house and the next. Vidor wore gray mechanics overalls, and it was figured out later that he had shaved his head mostly bald in the days prior. Some object was blocking the lower part of his face. It was a small square box made of metal with a thick mesh center. It was tied there tight over his mouth with a thin plastic strap. On both his right and left hip there appeared one green glowing circle, two small lights affixed to his belt, having almost the intensity of neon. The lights winked on, then winked out, came on and went out again, a pattern fed by a single 9-volt battery. In his right hand, Vidor held a long, thin object made stoutly of wood. Its butt end was pointed toward me, an iron stump tapering at a 5-inch hook blade. It was the heavy farming hoe he had beaten Dennis Thorpe to death with. 
His eyes were gaping unnaturally wide as he moved toward me. He looked sick, dangerously emaciated. Now a single sound broke through the house as Vidor lifted one foot absurdly high with weird slowness, and then stamped it down hard on the carpet before him, then repeated this motion with the other foot. Left foot, right foot, back and forth, tilting his torso forward not just for balance, but in a crude simulation of a rusty, two-legged machine just learning to walk. The weapon he held heavy and awkward enough to make the sequence more difficult. It was several seconds before Vidor appeared in the dim light of the living room. I had backed all the way to the base of the staircase, and as I reached behind me to touch the railing, I hollered out for Sammy as loud as I could. Vidor ended his forced march and stood straighter, carefully rebalancing himself. I couldn't see his mouth, but I heard him speak through the mesh set into that handmade prosthetic. The voice that came out was primitively amplified by another battery and single wire echoing in the cavernous room. Reveal faulty robot queen for correction, he said through the mask. The little green lights on each hip flickered and went out again. I heard the bedroom door open upstairs. Why? I said to this man. I was gripping the handrail ferociously beside me, my eyes flitting left and right, looking for something to defend myself with. Vidor lifted his surgically repaired right leg, arthritically and precariously, almost falling over, readjusting his grip on the farm hoe, whose heavy blade I could see better now. He brought his foot down hard on the wooden planks peeking through two sections of carpet. Hostile actions detected, the George bot told me. Erasure required. Sammy was running down the stairs now, barefoot in her sweatshirt and shorts. Vidor craned his neck upwards with artificial effort. Every move he made seemed to be dictated by an internal discipline to be something other than what his birth biology had dictated. Sammy stopped at the last hook in the staircase. I could only see her through the gaps in the risers. She was holding something in her right hand, something she had secretly borrowed from her cat sitter as she became paranoid about being followed. A 22 caliber short, the smallest and weakest handgun she could find. She was frightened of them but couldn't stop herself. Unbeknownst to me, she had hidden it under the bed upstairs after dinner. Vidor did not suddenly charge and pursue either one of us. He had no intention of charging us, Iris Ricks would later write because that kind of accelerated locomotion would not have been realistic in his new, fractured reality. Sammy did something that I have never seen anyone do in real life or in any movie. Unable to keep her aim steady, she sank to her knees on the carpet of the wide square riser well above me, holding the gun in both hands now, outstretched, aiming at the intruder twenty feet away. Seeing the gun aimed at him, Vidor, finally lost his composure. He took the hoe in both hands now, lifting it higher, and he swung the end of it back behind his right side like an oversized baseball bat. He whipped it around in a wide arc in front of him, cutting the air with a hollow thud. A ceramic lamp on a tall, skinny console table practically exploded under the force of direct contact, and the table toppled over. Vidor stepped over it. Sammy pulled the trigger. There was a low-pitched crack, and I saw the left shoulder of his overalls puff out. His body spun. There was a second of total silence as it seemed to dawn in his vacant eyes what had just happened. He let out a long, guttural, agonized, and vocally distorted moan, then backed up two steps, almost against the bricks of the electric fireplace. His weight suddenly went out from under him, and he sat down hard bone-breakingly hard on the ledge, silhouetted by the dim red light inside the hearth. Practically hurling herself down the rest of the stairs, Sammy nearly tumbled beside me. I grabbed her free arm and shouted at her to run. Our car keys were upstairs in the wrong direction. We tore towards the front door. I couldn't see now if Vidor's eyes were open or closed. He dropped his weapon and it clattered to the floorboards. 
His moaning continued, louder, still sounding like it was coming through an air traffic controller's microphone on a black box recording. I slammed the front door behind us and we were outside in the pre-dawn. It sounded like Sammy was hyperventilating, but it was actually me. We ran past our cars, but I had to stop and walk just halfway across the huge front lawn. I'd never make it to the curb at a gallop. Nothing inside my body was working right, especially my lungs. The bottoms of our feet slapped into the frost. My intention was to guide us to the right and make it to the next property, where I'd seen two cars parked when I'd first arrived. Surely someone would wake up inside. But Sammy had something else with her. The cheap, no-contract phone her parents had forced her to buy, which she'd brought inside that night, feeling like she did need that sense of close contact to her mother and father. She'd grabbed it instinctively from the dresser the moment I had screamed for her. We both stopped moving at the same time. Sammy's need to stop and make the call and my urge to look back coincided. Her connection to the 911 operator was bad enough to cause her to cry out in frustration and the phone was running out of power. But she got through a terrible stutter caused by fear and the biting cold and reported every key detail about our situation as we stared back at the front door. Help would be coming. We had to get to the next house over. But the front door of the one we'd just fled opened across the lawn the moment Sammy ended the call. George Vidor was sitting on the floor just inside her parents' foyer, slumped over and using the doorknob as a support to prop up his heavy bulk. He couldn't get up. For a moment, we saw just his face in the shadows and his right arm and his right hand grasping the doorknob. He looked out at us, helpless. He could not even speak at us now through his awful mask. A small, sad green light pulsated from his right hip. That I could see clearly. Sammy put her hand on my chest and pushed herself closer to me. And then Vidor somehow found the strength to twist himself and defiantly slam the door shut again closing himself inside. The neighbors were already out and coming towards us, a husband and wife. She was a runner and a surfer, and where I failed to spot the signs that Sammy was about to collapse, she managed to get her arms under Sammy's shoulders just as her eyes fluttered and closed, and she started to sink to one knee. The woman struggled to lift her, but then she was carrying her away, her husband making sure Sammy's head was cradled. Sammy reached out for my hand as her frozen feet left contact with the ground, and we all hurried together toward their door, which seemed so far away. But we made it. Suddenly there was warmth and stillness. I had lost hold of Sammy's hand at some point in the journey, but not for long. When the first police personnel got to the mansion just four minutes later, they understandably took the time to send officers all around the property to encircle it and work their way inward. I'm not sure how he was able to do it, but George Vidor had gotten to his feet and staggered back through the living room and down the hallway he'd originally come from. Likely in deep shock, he opened a side door, and leaving blood in slick splashes behind him, he walked out into the open air of the back acreage where the pond was. That's where they found him and cut him off. He was standing right at the edge of the pond, looking down at all that thin black ice. With the last of his strength leaving him, he was about to walk right out onto its precarious surface. He didn't know what he was doing, surely. Maybe he didn't even know where or who he was anymore. He turned. Five flashlights shone in his face simultaneously and shouts rained down on him, telling him not to move. He was unarmed. His green lights blinked on and off. Machine population expansion underway. He announced to the police in his home-brewed electronic voice. Human submission assured. And then they were on him. And then the George Bot weakened from many days without solid food, died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, and the George Bot's human self died with him. In the house belonging to the neighbors, 
the husband a Costco executive, and his wife a computer network architect with Samsung. The immediate evaluation of me and Sammy could not begin until we were physically separated. Someone had to finally force us apart and ever so gently undo our clasped hands. We rode in the same precautionary ambulance to the hospital, asked to lie flat on separate gurneys. Sammy looked over at me at one point, and I lifted my head, and I nodded at her again and again, as forcefully as I could. What I was trying to express to her in that moment, because no words would form through my river of tears, was that I wasn't going anywhere without her. Ever. I would stay close to her. Forever. And so, in the worst hour of my life, I got to feel, in one brief moment, possessed by a primal ferocity of will, almost a savagery of the heart, that to this day I have never recaptured. And that radiant blaze of fleeting, romantic courage was all, all of it, for Samantha Cash, the woman I'd met at the movies. That was all years ago. This week, Sammy sent me a New Year's card in the mail. And in it, she's done her best to answer the fragile question I had asked in my Christmas card to her. She remembers that on an early date, we'd theorized together that a good movie love story needed two things. It needed to make the audience see how these two people could be for one another what no one else could. And it needed to put them up against powerful obstacles to being together. But I guess... Sammy writes, before the airfield, we never did really have either one of those elements, right? I had once called us two prematurely tired millennials whose idea of a big Friday night was to rearrange our Netflix queues. It was nice and unspectacular and easy, and I don't think either one of us had the emotional energy to look around for anything more. So in her card, Sammy agrees it makes sense that we just ran out of connection. She remembers feeling that in the terminal as we said so long and kissed just before she got on board the plane. That sort of felt like the end of our real story to her somehow, right there. It was the terrible things after the airfield that added the dimension which fooled us into thinking we had something that was unbreakable, worthy of a script. She doesn't know whether that's ironic or cruel or just the way of the world. All I know, she writes, is that I think I'm finally going to beat the dark clouds. I really do. Eventually remembering everything didn't make them any stronger. And now, maybe she's right. Maybe we have gotten the dice to roll just so so that we've both been given another real chance with someone. It seems the way I wrote about Vicky to her in my card, just a two-line mention, tells Sammy, who knows me well, that I have become a slightly different person with a more hopeful vision of life. And she feels very good about Max and where they're going a year and a half in. God knows I'm still hurt and untrusting, she writes, but she doesn't feel tired. She ends her card by asking me if I've seen the new Wes Anderson. She and her folks and Maddie Snyder streamed it through three separate devices through a VR app that made it feel like they were all in a theater together. Maddie couldn't stop laughing. It's pretty good, Sammy writes, and sends her undying fondness.